larger things. And we'll, we'll do the keyhole liner for this drawer front that we're working on. And uh, you use lots of different things for inlay, like diamonds over keyholes. Uh, maple works good. Any contrasting wood. Uh, ebony. Uh, East Indian rosewood. That's a, that's a really good wood. I was lucky enough uh, several years ago I had a good friend in Nashville who lived next door to the uh, comp trailer for Gibson guitar. You remember back when Gibson had all that trouble with importing, illegally supposedly importing it, even, and federal agents came and seized it all. And, well, he was working there at the time. And just before all that happened, he called me one day and said, hey, my next door neighbor, oh, there Gibson says they've got these barrels full of cutoffs but they don't, they're trying to get rid of it. And I didn't know it was because of this investigation. <laughs> they're trying to get rid of it. Now Gibson does not use anything that isn't perfect, absolutely perfect. So they had all these fretboards, ebony fretboards for guitars. It had a flaw in it, they cut them in two, put them in the barrel. Or if they had an East Indian rosewood had a flaw in it, cut it in two, throw it in the barrel. They have a machine that saws the grooves for all of the frets. If that was a little off, throw it in two, throw it in the barrel. He said, would you like some of those? And I said, yeah, <laughs> I sure would. So I got a 55-gallon drum full of ebony fingerboards and East Indian rosewood fingerboards, about that long, about three-eighths of an inch thick. Great stuff. And it's the good stuff. It's, you know, nowadays, ebony is being advertised as having white streaks in it. That's good. It used to be good. If it had white streaks, nobody wanted it. And that really cut down the harvest of ebony trees in Africa. Perfectly good wood, it just had some streaks in it, it couldn't sell. So some wise person said, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. So now they sell it with streaks in it, which, which is fine, which probably quadruples the amount of available wood of any ebony lot, which is good, a good news for everybody. But I, I use ebony. I don't know if you've ever worked with ebony. Hard as a rock. Really hard, hard to cut, hard to carve. And you look at some of these things from the Far East where they carved the figure, it, how in the world they did that, I don't know. And, and look at the tools they used. They didn't have any Lee Nielsen super chisels. They made their own. Uh, one of my favorite videos is uh, a, a furniture company had a, had a, had a group in, in Indonesia that did all their carvings on their really fancy Chippendale chairs. They showed these guys that did it. They were sitting in the floor on a tire for a seat. They had chisels that they had made themselves or car springs. And they were sitting there doing the best carving you've ever seen, just going around, just perfect. And that was what we were talking about earlier. We don't understand what you can do with your hands if you do it seven days a week. You get really good at it. And that's what these guys did for a living all day long, and they got good at it. Uh, ball and cloth feet, y'all have seen ball and cloth feet? Mm -hmm. It takes me two, three days to make one. Uh, Al Breed, who's a woodworker up in Maine, he can do one. You sit there and watch it. He can do one in about an hour, mm -hmm. and it's perfect. But he's done thousands of them, and he's done it enough he uses, five, he uses five tools, five chisels with different radiuses. He's got these little jigs that he puts on the side of the foot, makes a mark here, mark here, mark there. In just a few minutes, it's done. And he says, I'm probably slow. He said in the 1800s, you had to be faster than that to make a living at it. If you remember those people, uh, the cabinet makers back then, they were in the business to make a living. If you couldn't see it, they didn't do anything. Uh, several years ago at uh, Yale University, who has one of the best collections of American furniture in the world, they had a display with all the faces of all the furniture turned to the wall, just the back. You could only see the backs. What a bunch of junk. Uh, they left a the bark on it. If you couldn't see it, they didn't do anything to it. And um, antiques I worked on, I found it's the same way. I worked on a Jackson Press a few years ago. Nice piece. And when you open the doors down at the bottom, the back, the Jackson Press has four posts, all three inch squares. And back in the back corner, <laughs> this one still had a, 
had a knot in it and, a, and bark off of it. I mean, the only good surfaces were those two on the outside that you could see. The inside, you, they didn't care. It was inside the camp, you couldn't see it anyway. So they didn't spend any time on things like that. Uh, we're going to make a keyhole inlay. We mentioned about the things you can make them out of, ebony, rosewood, any contrasting wood. Also use uh, piano keys. If you can find any old uh, piano keys, they were either ivory or celluloid, which both work well. The only thing, advice I can tell you is if you do use an old ivory keyhole and somebody asks you, if you show it somewhere like in a museum or something, and ask you what it's made out of, you tell them it's made out of celluloid. Because if you tell them it's made out of ivory, they will immediately tell you to take it out and, and uh, don't come back with it or provide provenance where you can prove that that's old ivory. They do not want to have anything to do with that. I still have a bunch of piano keys. I still use them. And some of the furniture you'll see today on these photographs have ivory keyhole lines. But nowadays, they make fake ivory. You can get this from uh, Lee Valley. And they make it in tortoise shell. They make it in mother of pearl. They make it in old ivory, which this is, new ivory. And it's a plastic mm. material. You can work it with woodworking tools. And it looks just like the real thing. And you can buy this, I broke this piece off. It comes in an eight and a half by 11 sheet, which would be a lifetime supply. I had already made a, made one up, and somehow I broke the tip off of it. So we're going to have to make another one. I'm going to show you how it has it. I use a lot of tape, different kinds of tape. And one of the ones I use most of is a double sided, double sided tape. I asked the people at Williamsburg, what would a colonial cabinet make for you? If you didn't have double set of tape, what would you use? And he said, take a piece of paper, put hot glue on both sides of it, you got double sided tape. So I use double sided tape a lot to hold things in place. We're going to use this as our pattern. And uh, we talked about earlier about drilling the hole for the uh, lock pin to go in. And this one has the hole already drilled. It's a quarter inch diameter, so you got a quarter inch drill that'll fit in there. And it'll also hold this in place. So we're going to pretend this does not have a broken chip on it. So I put a little piece of a double sided tape on the back. center line marked across here so that the point here and the point here lay on the center line. You don't want it in there like that or like that. You want it straight. So you have to have a center line all the way down through there. Slip it over the drill bit, line up the point on the top, point on the bottom, press it down. It's held in place. Now I'll get my X-Acto knife or a scalpel. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier that the scalpel is sometimes will follow the grain. It will more than it. Those exactos don't follow the grain as easy as the scalpel does. So that's held in place. And, we'll, and I, don't cut all the way through the first time. Just make a make a good healthy scribe line. We're going to use that Dremel tool again here in a minute. Okay, now that I've got the line established, I go back and reinforce it. And I use the same process. If I was inlaying a quarter fan or a, any other piece of inlay, I, I would do it the same way. When you... Uh, Inlay piece or template? This is, this is going to be the inlay piece, yeah. Even though the chip's broken off of it, I'm not going to take the time to cut another one out. We'll just use this. This will show you how to do it. So now we've got a good line of stuff. Take this out. Pop this off. And there's our line. And I usually go back over it a little bit. This is the line we're going to cut up to. See that. 
Okay, now we need to change cutters. We need that little inlay cutter. We need a ripper cutter. That's a quarter inch one in here. I use three sixteenths or so. I guess it is a quarter. It's a little miniature rabbit here. I get these from Stewart McDonald as well. Do not want to lose this. Okay. Back in our base. And this is where this light really comes in handy. See so much better with it. Hard to keep getting this cross ready. What did you say those threads were again? Nine sixteenths eleven. There you go. Zero this to the cutter. Tighten it down. And we're going to put our inlay. There it is. Put our inlay in here. Bring it down. Tighten it. Now, I want this to be. I want this inlay to be just a little proud of the uh, surface. So there's a micro adjustment on here. You can turn this, and that runs a little post inside there down a little bit. Gives you a little clearance. So this is ready. Okay, we turn the light on. Yeah. There. Make sure everything's okay. Get down here like this, like see when open. Can't do it with this thing on there. Got to take the fence off. There, that's better. Okay. Uh, start in the hole. You got a keyhole there? Start in there. That's not light. There you go. Cut as close to the line as you think you as you there. Okay, I'm gonna turn this around. See the V slot? You can see better on one side than the other. I'm coming to this end and I'll turn it around so I can see better. See right where the bit is. That's pretty good. That's as close as I dare get. You cut the full depth. Uh, cut the full depth I did. Uh -huh. In one pass. In one pass. On this. this is no, this is maybe a little under an eighth. I wouldn't go any more than that. I mean, that's the maximum I would do. I, I very seldom ever inlay anything that thick. That's probably twice the thickness I normally inlay anything. I normally just inlay stuff sixteenth or so. But if you look at antiques that had ivory uh, tiles, country, they were all this thick. Big old chunks of ivory. Yeah. Now, y'all have to use these, I do. Yeah, yeah. get my chisels back out. You know the difference between paring chisels and uh, bench chisels? Paring chisels have a, have a really long bevel, where bench chisels have a shorter bevel. These never hit with a hammer. You push them with your hand because of so. I didn't bring any of my paring chisels with me, but this is pretty close. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sneak up on that scribe line. Didn't bring my map. Oh, did I bring my mallet? You want a round mallet? I've got a brass. Oh, I've got a brass mallet somewhere. Well, I'm glad I didn't bring it. 
You know why you want a round mallet, don't you? I don't line up. You don't have to line the face up. A round one's always lined up. You got one of these, you gotta get it lined up. It's round, just get it. Well, I guess I didn't bring it. Steve, get your round mallet. Yeah, good. Listen, I can push this down. Okay, now I've got over close enough, I'm now in the line. That's it right up. Indexing back off the cut I just made, just like we did before. That way, index off of this side back this way. You find one? Oh, good. Yeah, I'll try this one. Thank you. The mallet I have at home, I made out of a dogwood stump probably 30 years ago. It still works. When you get up here in this corner, take a little out of both sides first. I didn't mention this earlier, but when you get this cut out, I use, we talked about these earlier, I use these all the time. These are emery boards. You can buy them at the beauty shop in varying grits. They're a nice flat surface for trimming things up, and I hit the back corner, give it a little bevel, so it's thinner on the back than it is on the front, so as you push it down, it fits tight. Okay, getting close here. You should never try to chop to the line if there's more than maybe a 30 second wood because it's a bevel, that's a bevel. And when you drive it in, it pushes it that way. So if you put that right on the line with not much, with, with a bunch of wood behind it, it's gonna move you over. You want a minimum amount of wood on the back side of the chisel when you, when you, when you chisel to the line so that it does not move the chisel over. Very important if you're cutting dust. Okay, now that I've got that out, I've got a couple of other chisels. There's the other row. Oh, here it is. I did invest in these a few years ago. These are cranked left hand and right hand, one eighth inch chisels. They will get right up in the corner. Pop that right out. I don't know how you would do it if you didn't have those chisels. They used to do it by, by hand, but those things work so much better. If you can find a woodcraft store going out of business, you can make a good buy on those things. There you go. And we're gonna go back into this lower end and take some extra wood out. Again, I'm not getting anywhere near the line. All right, now I can get to it. Try to hold that chisel as vertical as you can when you cut to the line. All right. Now we'll go down the other side. Okay, I can get to the line now. You can feel, you can feel the chisel fall into the, that scribe line. You can feel it. You can hear it, make a little sound. A lot of times your, your hands, your sense of feel will tell you more than your sight will tell you. And the sound will make a difference. I enjoy doing this. Patrick Edwards is the name of the guy, the luthier out on the uh, marketer out on the West Coast. It's so good. And I was at a 
meeting that he was at. He was talking about how much he loved what he did. And he said, when people come and watch me work, he said, you know what the first thing they say is when they watch me work? He said, they say, gosh, it must take a lot of patience to do that. And his answer was, no. Patience is what it takes to do a job you don't want to do. He said, I enjoy this. <laughs> I do not have to have patience to do this. And I said, that's exactly right. Yeah. I enjoy the process. Okay, we're down to the very last corner here now. And this is where we're going to have to get a chisel right back in the corner. Okay, final cut on this side. Final cut on this side. Right there. And we're done. This little crank chisel has a bevel on the end and it gets right up into the corner and gets out that last little bit of scrap wood. Yeah. Those those are Swiss made chisels, is that right? Yeah, these are Swiss made. 2A31 is this one and the other is a 2B31. But uh, like on the inlay on that uh, spice box over there, hard to do without these chisels. Okay, now that it's all hollowed out, I'm gonna put our wire in. Oh, there's, there's an up and a down on these, these, you know, left and a right, and I didn't mark it. <laughs> when you put it down there, you need to make sure you've got the right side up, because if it's not symmetrical, when you put it down, that thing doesn't fit. Well, you've got it wrong. Okay, let's see how close we got. Little, a little tight on this side, right here. Let's see how that goes. That's it, right there. Now, there's a drill for this. We're gonna glue this thing in place. And uh, it's very important that you get even pressure on it when you're gluing it in and it was too small I'll show you what I use for that that was too small you can't have you can't have too many too many chisels, in my opinion. Okay, you've just seen how I did that with the Dremel tool. There are other tools you could use too. You can use that little router plane. <laughs> you can sit it. And I use this uh, like for ovals bigger ovals and things you're inlaying. This this thing, when you get through with the Dremel tool, sometimes there's a little rough surface left. You use this one, it'll clean it right up. Loosen this up. Drop it down to the surface. Up there. A little bit more. There it goes right there. It'll clean it right up. This is a Lee Nelson one. I mean a uh, Lee Valley one. This is what everybody used to use. That's an old Stanley one. They look good too. But they clean up the, and they level things up perfectly. <laughs> Got little high spots, this will take it out. Good. Get the trash out. Now I'm going to take a take our inlay, our little sanding board. I'm going to sand the 
at an angle, not that back corner. I did not bring a C clamp with me. Are there any F clamps or C clamps? Just a small one. And I, I don't cut the keyhole, you know, the keyhole it looks at the bottom, you got a round hole and a little piece goes, I'll cut that after I get it installed. I cut the little lower part after I get it installed. This thing's got to go down together like that. There you go. Hear that? It'll snap. It right in there. Uh, whenever you glue down a pad array or inlay, you need to have some sort of padding between. So uh, make sure you get good even pressure. I use this one. This is rubber shelf liner, like you'd have for a toolbox. That works well. Cork works well. This stuff, packing stuff works well. It gives you a good even pressure. For this one, we're gonna use the rubber. And we need a piece of scrap wood to go over the top of it. Oh, I'm gonna use this. Uh, if I was worried about the glue squeezing out, I'd put a little piece of a, either packing tape or a piece of wax paper on there to keep it from sticking to this. rubber is not as important uh, for uh, that kind of inlay as it is for an eagle or a quarter fan like this. More important. Rubber is more important for these things. This will work. So we'll let that dry a little while and we now have a keyhole inlaid on our drawer fan. Locks. I don't know how many ever put locks in or not, the drawers, but not all locks are symmetrical. The center, the pin of the lock is not always in the center of the mass of the lock. Some locks are that way, some are not. You need to pay attention. This one is not. This one's off this side. And I made a whole set of drawers one time, hauled all this out and realized that the locks that I had were not on the center. So I had to go buy a whole other set of locks. So you need to pay attention to where your locks are. I usually just uh, route these out either with a little router or a lot of times just do them by hand. I get my locks from Horton Bryce. I like their stuff real well. Uh, they're a little less expensive than ball and ball. And uh, I've been very pleased with the stuff I've gotten from them over the years. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Where do you say you got those locks? Uh, Horton Brass. Oh, okay. And uh, the one I use most of is LK Lock, LK1, I think is what it is. LK1, and you can use it for a drawer lock or a door lock. They make them, if you're going to use it for a door lock, they make a left hand and a right hand. Door, door. Okay. Yeah. Work for a lid. Yeah. No, won't, won't work for a lid. A lid's got to have something that yeah. catches it. Yeah. yeah. Different, different one entirely for a lid. Have those. Yeah, they do. Oh yeah, they have. They have uh, box lids, small box lids, jewelry box lids. They have all kind of uh, of uh, locks for all those different applications.
I didn't bring something with me, but I, I will tell you about it. Uh, I made this. I made this probably. I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. I had it for a long time. It's one of the first things I ever inlaid a lot on. And uh, I learned the lesson. Like when you come up here and look at it, you'll notice that the veneer has come loose right here along the seam. And the reason is I didn't get good, good did, did not get good, good glue coverage. And I've got a bubble right here, and I've got a tear right there. And I can tell you that when I made it, I didn't notice that. It, it's happened over the years. But I don't worry because I've looked at antiques. They all look like that. They've got some flaw in them. And I don't worry about flaws or dings or, or things. This thing's been dinged up. It sits in my hallway when you come in the front of the house under a hot board. And it's been hit by the vacuum cleaner several times, but I don't care. Um, the kind of furniture I want to build, uh, years ago I saw a uh, United Van Line commercial. And uh, during the football game, came up this United Van Lines commercial. There was this woman standing in her bedroom. She was looking at this cannonball bed. She was looking at it, and the announcer comes on and he says, Your great grandfather built that bed from a tree on the land that he homesteaded. Your grandfather was born in that bed. Your father was born in that bed. That scratch on the headboard is where his brother flew a choo-choo train at him in 1933. You're about to move this piece of furniture across the United States. Call Allied Van Lines. We care as much about your furniture as you do. <laughs> I said, that's the kind of furniture I want to build, stuff like that. And I want to build something. I sign everything I make, put my name in the net and date in there. And I also, if I have layout marks that you're not going to see, I leave them. There's nothing I like better than working on an antique and find where somebody has marked something. Or find out where they screwed up. <laughs> and one of the pieces I'm going to show you that's in the Tennessee State Museum, the guy screwed it up. And nobody noticed it until I saw it. And I said, that ain't right. And the curator said, you're right, it's not right. But uh, I always like to find things they messed up or where they cut a tenon wrong and had to patch it. Just all kinds of things. If you're going to make furniture, you've got to find out how to fix stuff because you will make lots of mistakes. Uh, let's talk about how to do this inlay on the side. And, uh, yeah, on, on the side. You see, you've got these, you've got <clears throat> these little half rounds here. Of course. The string's plain string, but it's got a half round there. Right here. So how do you lay that out? Well, the way I do it, is I took a piece of half inch MDF and cut it to look like this. Double side taped it down to the wood. Used my Dremel tool with a long shank bit on it so that the bit, the bit is the bit's an eighth inch diameter shank, but the cutter is only a sixteenth. So you've got clearance. So you can just follow it right around and make that. Only thing you have to do is stop at the corner. You can't, you can't go around that corner. So you run up to here and stop, run up here and stop, around here and stop, down here and stop, and then go back like we did before and finish up that last little corner with the touch of it. Doesn't take any time. You can stick that on there and just wrap around it. And uh, so then you got the problem of curving that. How you gonna, how you gonna do that? We do that with moisture and heat. And uh, they used to use uh, a fireplace with a hot pipe or something where they warm it up. Nowadays, you can go to Home Depot and buy a $9 heat gun. And that radius right there works pretty good <laughs> for bending things. And uh, you can bend. This is the tightest radius you can bend on it, but you can bend bigger radiuses because it's, it's uh, it, you can still be able to bend, bend the bigger radius, you can't bend the smaller one. So if you need to bend small radiuses, then you need to go to your soldering irons. And I've got a whole collection of those. They get they're hot out here, they get less and less and less and less and less. There's a sweet spot right in there where the, I'll show you here in a minute, where the, uh, Stringing, the wet stringing will, will sizzle, but it won't burn. But it's making steam, and it'll bend right around there. I've got 
I don't know, five or six soldering irons. Got one about that big, got one a little smaller than this, and just clamp them in a vise and use them. We'll, uh, we'll bend, bend a couple. Is there a bite? Yeah, there's a bite here. We have an electric bending iron. Yeah, we have a loose ears. We do use that. I inlay a lot of stuff. I, I built flintlock rifles, and I inlay them. I started bringing one, but I didn't know if y'all would be interested in that or not. They inlaid with wire, got wire inlay, brass inlay, sterling inlay, all kinds of inlay. Okay, let's get more. Let's get a little piece of string in I try not to waste this stuff. I'm gonna run out of it someday. Uh, it's important that you have a backing. Uh, when you're bending this, you can have something on the back side of it or it'll split out. I usually just use the back of a chisel blade. Like that, just hold it down. Put the water on this. Doesn't take it long. Mm. I get a drink before I get rid of it. Can you use a spray bottle? If you got one, that'd be perfect. Being real tight radiuses over that little. Have y'all had the problem with your iPhone doesn't recognize you with a mask on? <laughs> mine, mine has facial recognition. And it's, who are you? <laughs> I've had trouble with thumbprint recognition if I've been doing a bunch of sand. Oh, yeah, I had that too. <laughs> sand your fingernail or your fingerprints off. It don't work too well if you got glue all over your hand. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> And I don't have any moisture on this, you see? Oh, great, thank you. It doesn't take much just to spritz the water on it. You just try to make a little steam. This one's not splitting out, there you go. Easy to do. Now I'm gonna turn this off and I'm gonna put the heat in there. I got some something where the heat won't go. Got a metal plate in here. That thing's about to fall apart. I clamped this one in the vise too. This one's not trying to split. If it was trying to split, see that? Did not put anything behind it. You can use a piece of brass feeler gauge material and lay it on top and do it all at the same time. Uh, luthiers do that a lot for perfling and things on the cars.
you know, that was a little way right in there. Uh, let me just go back to the slides a minute. This is a drawer out of my toolbox. Yep, keep going back forward. Jackson's sure chest. It's at the Hermitage. That's my copy of his sure chest. Um, in Alabama, you will not know what a sure chest is. Sure chests were unique to Middle Tennessee, Central Kentucky. They were unique for three reasons. First one was geographical. It just so happens that in the late 17, early 1800s, up to around 1840, sugar was a hard, it was an expensive commodity in Middle Tennessee, Central Kentucky. And the reason is, the only way they had to get it there, come up the river from New Orleans, down the Ohio, or Ohio, then down to Cumberland, and then down to Nashville, and you get your sugar. And in Louisville, and the other way, in Kentucky, went up to Louisville where you got it. So you had to go, your sugar was only available to you a few times a year. So when you went and got it, you had to buy it in bulk. It was expensive. In the county I grew up in, in 1804, a pound of sugar cost more than an acre of land. So it was valuable. So you had to have something to store it in under lock and key because people would pilfer it. And uh, so that called on a piece of furniture to store it in. The sugar came either as brown, what we would call brown sugar today or in cones, white sugar that was in a cone. And it was covered with blue paper. It was big. So you had to have a pretty good sized container to hold it in. Inside of it's divided into two, two sides. The box at the top has two divisions inside, one for the brown sugar, one for the, for the cone sugar. The drawer at the bottom held the tongs that you would use to nip off a piece of sugar. So, if you, had, if you were wealthy enough to buy sugar, a place to store it, a fancy place to store it. The second reason, or the third reason, you got geographic, economic, the third one was you wanted to show off people came to visit your house, you wanted to be able to tell them, I'm well off enough that we can afford sugar. It's in that sugar chest right over there. To this day, in Murray County, where I grew up in Middle Tennessee and Central Kentucky, owning a family sugar chest is a big deal because we were well enough off back then to own sugar. We were a little higher than the rest of the people to this day. A used sugar chest, an old original used sugar chest, even though antiques have gone way down in price, not sugar chest, a junky one will bring six or seven thousand dollars. What size is that? It's about this way, about that deep, about that tall. And uh, this one was the one that was in Andrew Jackson's at the Hermit. You would expect Andrew Jackson, being well off, to have the best sugar chest anybody had. You'll notice this one has tapered legs. Later ones had turned legs. So this, this piece was a very early sugar chest. The problem is it's decorated in a federal style, which was 50 years later. I've talked to the curators at uh, the, this book called The Art and Mystery of Tennessee Furniture. And the guys that wrote it are experts on Tennessee furniture. I had met them and I asked them about this. I said, you know, I reproduced this. And I said, it isn't right. I said, it's got tapered legs and all that federal inlay on it. I said, it couldn't have been made um, for Jackson. And they said, yeah. I said, we agree. But, uh, because anytime you get into antiques, you got this provenance problem. Well, where did this sugar chest come from? Well, the Hermitage was, was a was a soldier's home after World War, after Civil War, and soldiers lived there, and they weren't any furnishings, they were all gone. So they had to go back and get them. So they go to relatives of Jackson family and say, well, you know, this sugar chest came from, came from the Hermitage, it was, it was there. So family history says it was there. What I think, and what the guys that wrote the book think was, that the original tapered leg chest was probably there. And sometimes, at, sometime after that, some itinerant cabinet maker came through there and said, let me dress that chest up for you and put all that inlay on it. And I, I think that's, that's what happened. Because this guy, you know, it's way over the top on inlay. And uh, like I said before, you would have put that right in the dining room or in the living room of your home 
So when people came in the door, they said, oh, you're well off. You've got a sugar chest. And right next to your liquor, your liquor chest. What's well, what would you do? Soda red. Yeah. And I've got one. I'll show you one of those later, too. I've got one of them. But anyway, that, that was what that chest was made for. You know where they've got it at the Hermitage? They've got it in a storeroom. Butler's pantry, basically, off the dining room is a butler's pantry, and it's sitting in there. And the guys that wrote the book on the Hermit on the Tennessee furniture said that thing's in the wrong place. It needs to be in the living room. Or the dining room is where it needs to be. But the, you get people who are putting stuff in the museums today that are recent graduates from from recent schools who have a whole different view of the world than we do. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, stored sugar? Oh, it needs to go back in the cupboard. They don't know anything about this history. So anyway, that's, that's, that's it. Now, start looking at those curves. Those little curves, see those? On the sides, on both sides, on the front, on the drawers, on the legs. Start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20. There was about 45 or 50 on each of those of these things mm -hmm. on there. I had to make I made about 80 of them. I had that heat gun and I had a process going. So I'd stick them in water and I'd bend them and I'd put a strand around them, hold them in shape, clip them off, put them on a pig. So I had a whole a whole stack of them before I ever started uh, inlaying that piece. And then all I had to do was go pick them up, stick them on there. So I got good at making these. And uh, that boxwood strain, that's exactly what's on there, right there. Uh, other thing you'll notice is in the center, there's a pinwheel. Go to the, I think there's another slide there. I've never seen one of these. And there, there, there's the front. Now, it's just got bell flowers down the legs. It's got uh, what's called barber pole inlay. That's uh, holly and uh, ebony. I made, made all that. I made. Uh, 32 feet of that, I think. Okay, go to the next one. There's the pinwheel. Pinwheel's about, about that big. I laid it out. I, I was an engineer, and I, I was in school back when they still taught engineering graphics, where you still had to draw. You don't do that anymore. But, but I had to take a graphics course, and one of the things you took was geometrical construction, where they show you how to make all these different geometric shapes, and one of them was a pinwheel. And I went back, and I still have my graphics book, and when I saw that, I went back to my graphics book, and sure enough, there it was, how to make one of those. There's 64 cuts in that. 64 cuts. And uh, when I laid it out, it was this big. When I got through putting it together, it was this big. <laughs> it shrunk. And the reason is, you took a 64 of an inch out every time you cut. So the thing shrunk. So thank goodness I made the pinwheel before I tried to inlay it. And it's ebony and hollow with uh, this stringing around the outside of it. Okay, go to the next slide. I made three of them at the same time. <laughs> and the wood is walnut. It came from the Hermitage. Ground to the Hermitage. In 1974, do y'all remember when all the tornadoes came through North Alabama, went up through Ohio? And I was living in Athens at the time, Athens, Alabama, and man, wiped us out. Went right across the Hermitage and, and knocked down a bunch of trees. And the ladies' society, whoever the group is that runs the Hermitage, hired a log company out of Illinois to come down and harvest the trees that had been knocked down because of the tornado. These trees were, you know, this big. And, uh, friend of mine who lived in Tullahoma, Tennessee, uh, got in touch with a logger and said, I want to buy some of those logs from you. And so he bought them, got them cut up, stored in his barn. And they were there from 1975 until I started using them in, uh, when did I make that about? 2005, I guess. So they air dried them. Boards were this wide, 16 feet long, five quarters. We had a stack, huge stack. We went through it, picked out the three best boards he had. The whole chest is made out of one board. The butt end is on the top where all the grain is. And then the sides are, book, are matched. The grain just wraps around, cut this piece, cut that piece, and cut this piece. So the grain follows all the way around. So that's, a, that's Andrew Jackson's sugar chest, made out of wood that came from his property. 
Did you resaw those for the saw? I did not. They they're five quarter, and I planed them down to seven eighths. So I wasted some wood. But I didn't have. There's no glue joints. The top's not glued up. And so, the side, nothing's glued up. Those are solid boards. The back's a solid 24 inch wide yellow poplar board, old green yellow poplar. So those are, those are, I'm really proud of those. I have one, my, my friend who I got the uh, lumber from has the other one, and his brother, another friend of mine, has the third one. But that's where they are. So you don't see walnut on the back? Uh, no. The way those things were made, all <clears throat> church chests were all made the same way. That's another thing we can talk about here. Uh, and they're not a good design. And I'll show you why. The front of the box, it's just a box. <clears throat> okay. Half blind dovetails on this side, half blind dovetails on that side. So when you look at the front, it's smooth. You can see the dovetails on the side. The back, half blind dovetails on the back. So the side is smooth until you see the back. The back dovetails are visible on the back. This is poplar, that's not a walnut. That's where they're all made. And the top goes on there. And the top is hinged. And there was a lock right here. This was one board for the top. They did not allow for shrinkage and and expansion. So every old sugar chest you see, if you want to make sure it's old, there are three things to look for. First thing is the hinges have got to have been replaced because there were no stop hinges and they didn't put a string in there. People would move them away from the wall and open the lid up and the thing would fall over and bust the hinges off. The other thing you look for is the lock. The lock's always replaced. And the reason is when you close the lid, say it's summertime, we close the lid, if it's just right, we lock it. It's now cold. Things have shrunk. Open the lock, it won't lock. The top is shrunk and the pins in the lock are locked in. They will not open. You've got to wait till the humidity comes and spreads it back out to open it. So what do they do? They get a knife or something, get up on there and pry it open with some damages all of this. Bad design, but that's where they're all made. The other thing you look for is on the feet, the bottoms of them. The feet on sugar chests and, and jelly cupboards and all that sort of stuff should be discolored. They should look different. They should be dark. And the reason is, if you were living back in those times, and you had sugar or cakes or something perishable stored in one of those compartments, what are you gonna do about bugs? You don't have any ray to put on. What are you gonna do? Well, what they did was took fruit jar lid, filled it with kerosene or coal oil, as it would have been called, and set the feet in a, in a, in a, in a fruit jar lid full of coal. Ants couldn't cross it. Soaks it up in the feet and stains the feet. They're all that way. Our originals are all that way. And um, when I was at Williamsburg this last year, uh, they were talking about Southern Furniture. And they had <laughs> this lady that's the head curator of furniture there. And she's smart, she knows her business. But she'd gone to Yale or somewhere. And they were talking about sugar chips. And I was telling her about, about there. I said, when I was a kid, I, I had an aunt had a jelly cupboard, and they had coffee can lids down there, and they'd fill it with coal, keep ants out. Her jaw dropped. Really, she said. And I said, yeah. I said, everybody knows that. And she'd never heard of that before. And she said, well, I've noticed that the feet were discolored, never knew why. Uh, people, don't, people don't tell you everything. My mother made really good dressing, you know, cornbread dressing, really good dressing. And I, I watched her make it every time, watched her make it, wrote down every step. So I knew that someday when she was gone, I was wanting, I would want to know how to make it. So I'd make it just exactly like she did. Never tasted it right. It was gun, gun tasting. You know, just, just, the consistency wasn't right. So. One thing, the last Thanksgiving she was alive, she was at our house, and I, it was Thanksgiving morning, and I said, well, I'm gonna go ahead and put on the uh, dressing, and I need to go ahead and make a pan of cornbread. And she said, you mean you hadn't made it already? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And she said, well, you gotta make the cornbread two or three days ahead of time so it's dry, otherwise, <laughs> your dressing will be gummy. <clears throat> 
And I said, well, you never, you never told me that. And she, said, right. and she said, honey, everybody knows that. <laughs> so, so there are these things in life that are so common that people think everybody ought to know, but they don't tell you. And, and that's one of them, you know. But like, I understood about the discoloration of the feet. She never heard of it. Anyway, that, that was a, that was a, a, a challenge building those, and uh, they, they came out really well. I also uh, had uh, a couple of pieces of wood left from that. I think we got seven of those big boards. I only used three, so I had two more boards left. And the other two boards, I built copies of Robert E. Lee's grandfather clock. Um, when Ar Robert E. Lee was at Arlington, before the Civil War, he had a tall case clock stood in his front hall. When the Civil War broke out, the Union forces took over Arlington and turned it into a cemetery and sold all of Lee's possessions. He had to leave, couldn't take anything with him. So he sold all his possessions. They sold the clock, the tall case clock, to a jeweler in New Jersey who had it for a number of years. And uh, he eventually moved to, uh, where is, what town is William and Lee, um, Washington Lee University in, in Virginia? Anybody know? Anyway, he moved to that town. And that's where Washington Lee University was. And Lee, of course, was the president there. And when the jeweler died, he left the tall case clock that came from Arlington to Washington Lee University. And it's in Washington's house now. If you go down there and walk in the front door, it's standing right there. And I made four of those over the years out of, out of Andrew Jackson's walnut, Robert E. Lee's clock. Pretty good combination. So I, I, I marked all that, all that wood that came from the Hermitage. It's got a yellow paint on the end of every bit of it. So I, I, know, I know where it came from. Did your stack of veneer come from that, that same log or some of, same wood? Some of it did, but not all of it. But these are all solid. These are not veneer. That's the way the original was made. What's the finish? Oh, uh, on this, <clears throat> I used a, uh, I used, I used to use linseed oil and thin it with mineral spirits. I never could get the stuff to dry. You know, three months later, you could see a little bits of oil coming through the surface. So I quit using linseed oil, boiled linseed oil, quit using that, and went to uh, water locks. Water locks will dry. So I took water locks and I mixed it 50-50 with mineral spirits. Painted all the show surfaces over with that. Rubbed a coat, I used a foam brush, painted it, painted on that, what, or that uh, water locks. And you can watch it sink into the surface. It'll sink into some places, others it won't. I put a little more on it. Let it stand for maybe 30 minutes, an hour, half an hour, 30 minutes, something like that. And then take cloths and wipe off the ex excess. And those cloths are flammable. So you need to take those and put them outside in a bucket of water. Let it dry for probably two weeks. It takes that long. And anywhere there are any pores in the wood, especially walnut, eventually over time that oil will seep out and leave little spots. So you go back and rub those off, take a little rag of little mineral spirits on it, knock those off until it's dry. Then, and this on these, I used um, uh, one coat of orange shellac. Orange shellac on walnut and cherry gives it, gives it a really nice color. And I spray it, I spray it on, and I spray on the shellac. It's not good to breathe shellac vapors, by the way, especially if you use demineral, um, Denature alcohol. 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 has got all kind of bad stuff in it. You do not want to vaporize that stuff and, and breathe it in. <clears throat> I don't use it anymore. I use pure grain alcohol to buy at the liquor store. If you can drink it, you can spray it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's what I use. And it, it cuts shellac way better than, than the other. The, uh, the mineral denatured alcohol has a little water in it. Water and shellac don't mix good. So if you want to put a really good shellac coat on, go down to the liquor store and get you some uh, golden grain, you know, a liter of golden grain alcohol. Works way better. Everclear. Everclear. That's another one they used to have, Everclear. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, used to thin the shellac with that, spray it on a coat, uh, sanded it lightly, and then I put on three or four coats of a, of a rub-on varnish, which was a mixture of tongue oil and varnish and something else I got a formula from some guy and used it. You rub it on there, you use a cotton pad, wrap it in a, a nylon stocking, and it's almost like French polish, rub it on there. And that's what I used on that. I don't, I don't use that anymore, but that's what I used on those. 
I use lacquer nowadays. I spray lacquer. Still put the shellac on because it warms it up, but I spray lacquer. And I spray a dull lacquer. I do not like a gloss lacquer. It looks too plastic. You want something that looks flat. And a dull lacquer is what I use nowadays. And the good thing about lacquer is, man, you can fix anything. You can't screw up. If you screw up lacquer, you can fix it. Easy. So that's what that's what I, I use nowadays. If I was building those today, I'd put lacquer on. What would they have used? Oh, they would use shellac or uh, copal. Stuff called copal varnish. It's basically made out of a sap from a from a tree, out of a pine tree sap. That's probably what they would use. They call it copal varnish. That's that's probably what would have been used. That's the stuff that turns black in alligators. You know, you've seen old furniture oh, yeah. that turns black in alligators. Now, a lot of people they don't they want they say they want that on the surface. Boy, I don't. I want to know what the thing looked like when the guy built it. That ugly old alligator black surface, it's sticky. If you get it on a chair and you sit in it, it sticks to you. Why would you want that in your house? But people do. Okay, so we now covered how to how to do those. Um, let's look here at the front of this. Do you notice the, the drawer looks like it's two drawers? It's only one. See those little those little pieces of training there? That look familiar? <laughs> See it? Now, there are two pieces of that. There's a U here and a U here, and they're spliced in the middle. And you always splice it out here in a straight run. Never try to splice it in the curve. Splice it in a straight run. And you do that with a straight blade. I use a straight blade razor blade. You use single blade edge razor blades. The two would, would overlap, and you just cut them with a straight blade razor, and they fit right in just fine. You cut them at an angle. Uh, yeah, always at a 45 angle. Yeah, always. And you can splice all kinds of inlays uh, if you pay attention to it. Uh, like this banding right here. If this isn't long enough, you can come back in and cut it right here at one of these black lines and slip the next one in. You'll never see it. You'll never see it. This uh, piece of furniture, this, this is a Pennsylvania spice box. Yeah, I'm sure y'all have seen, these have been, lots of these are measurements. Uh, <clears throat> first one of these I ever saw was in a book called Colonial Homes. We used to have a magazine called Colonial Homes. And uh, I got, I subscribed to that. And I got a copy of it one month and it had a advertisement right in the front that says, we're having a big show in uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania. That's in, uh, I don't remember the name of the town, but anyway, it's in Chester County, Pennsylvania. That's where these were made originally. And we're going to have a display of 150 of all we know in existence originally. And if you can't come to the show, you can buy a catalog. It'll show all the pictures of all the pieces with dimensions, who made them, they think, what they were made out of, and the wood, views on all sides and interiors. It was $10. I said, well, I'll invest in that. So I bought it. And that's what I've used to build spice boxes all these years is out of that book, just like the original. That book now is about, if you can find it, it's about $300. It's just a little pasteboard book. But boy, it's got some good information in it. And that's where this one came from, and that's where this, this design for this face came from. Now, being an engineer, I drew all that out first, full size. Drew it all out. So that I knew where my pivot points would be all these arcs. And what you want to what you're shooting for is anytime you let me show you what I can use. This, I, in fact I use this very tool right here. Here's this router. Pour the table with the little bits that we talked about in there. Put a piece of plexiglass on it with all these different points. And there's a pin that goes in there. And that'll cut all these different radiuses. So when, when the pin goes in, to cut this one, it goes right there. So that when you put the dot on it, you don't see the hole. And these, these arcs here, they lay out here. When you lay all this out, full size, you can come up with it. But the arc for these is out here, and they're covered by this. 
And the arcs for these, they're out here off the side. You have to put another piece of wood out there. Uh, this is the only piece of furniture I ever worked on that has locust wood in it. The originals had locust in it. And this is maple, maple and red cedar and and locust. There's some locust in here. Oh yeah, these little things ain't got a locust. But once you once you draw this out full size and you have all your radiuses, it's just a matter of stepping through each piece and cutting it. Now, wait, what I did on this one, the order here, I put all it in before I cut the groove for that banding or for that string. That way it came out just right. This is already inlaid. It was bigger than this. And I cut the arc for that, cut the arc for the inside, and it looks like it fits perfectly. So you start cutting from the inside and work your way yeah. out yeah. to hide your points. To hide the points. And you got to remember also how these line, how these, these all overlap. See, over and under, over and under, over and under, over and under. You got to lay that out. Figure that out. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a, graphic process to go through and do all that. And you have these holes where you've got, this is called lining and buried, and lines and buried. And uh, when I start these, I drill the holes for the berries first so I can start the bit in the hole rather than have to plunge it in. I start the hole and stop it here. This is a tulip flower. And then it's got drawers on the inside. It's got hidden, it's got hidden pockets, hidden drawers in it. This is the way the originals were made, just like this. You slide it back up, it locks back in, you don't know what's there. You can also do it, you can also do this with a fake, then you got a pocket, an area up under there that you can put something in, behind that molding. You can also make it where this front molding is part of the drawer. And it goes in and it's got a spring, a little a springy piece of wood that drops in a notch to hold it in place. So you reach up in there with a nail, push it up, and you can pull the front molding off. And it's got a drawer in there. I made another one. Uh, there's a, a lot about the geometry of these that I learned when I went up there and looked at the originals. <laughs> and I'll tell you, this this fits good. These, you know, this is all good. Not the originals. Boy, they didn't fit anywhere near that. Do we talk about how things went to, on cross grain? Where you tear on cross grain? They just left it. I mean, they, you can see where they torn it out. But it's so old that the finish had just gotten so grimy that you didn't notice it. You can still see this pattern, but you got a close look at it, and man, they didn't do a very good job on that. And then when you open the door, you can see where they've done a layout on the back side, screwed up and stopped. You <laughs> turned it over and used the other side. So this side would have some of the layout on it, and not all of it. They, they were something. But the really good ones, I learned. I learned from it. This one is not right. And the reason it's not right is, see this mold, this banding right here? See the distance between there and the edge? See what that is? See the distance between this one and the edge? Way too much, it's way bigger. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be symmetrical. That, rec that banding rectangle is supposed to be in the center of this. So if you make one right, this whole thing would be shifted over this way and the Banding would go right through that keyhole so that the distance between this edge and the edge of the banding and this edge and the edge of the banding is the same. That's the way a good one was made. <laughs> and every one I've made since I made this, and that's why I was. But only your eye would, would catch that. <laughs> well, it's one of those things that you never notice it until somebody shows it to you. And you say, right. oh, yeah, that's not right at all. Did you copy something that? Did you intentionally make it off center, or is that just. I didn't know any better. I, I had a, I had a fat, 
fine woodworking plan from years ago that had this basic box with this basic layout on the inside, completely different uh, layout on the front, but it had this layout. So I built a box and I got ready to decorate the door and I looked in that book I had and I found a decoration I thought was really nice and I used it, not understanding that I should have shifted it over until after I got it already made. So it's centered in the door, but it's not centered in the Yeah, it's centered in the door, but not in the case. There you go. That's, that's the way to look at it. Mm -hmm. This was a, this, one of the reasons I like this piece. It's the first time I ever used any lacquer. And I got a really good finish. That's the first piece I ever lacquered. So you can see how to make, how to make these. This is not hard. You need a little water, a little heat. A little patience and you can bend these. And uh, it's, it's important that once you start something, like bending these, I've been, I go ahead and bend all of them for the whole project. Don't bend a few, then come back and bend a few later. Do them all. Do them all one and a half. Uh, this afternoon we'll talk about the uh, how to do this double 45 degree mitre on the corners. That's, that's important. I'll do that. Uh, let's see, what time is it? Are those solid? 1135. Uh, I'm sorry? Is it solid wood or is that veneered? What's that? The smaller chest. Oh, it's, it's all veneered. That, that little chest is all veneered. It's uh, it's uh, walnut veneer on walnut. And uh, see this? The way the original, this was a, this was a tea keg. We talked about how expensive sugar was. Tea was the same way. And of course, the English had the market on tea. And lots and lots and lots and lots of, of, of uh, English tea caddies were available. If you do a search on the internet, you can get, you can see pictures of thousands of different English tea caddies. American tea caddies, very rare. This is a copy of an American tea caddy called this guy. The Eagle inlay on, which is of course federal, and uh, two containers, two holes. Look at that. Twining's tea. <laughs> it would have been loose too. And the inside would have been lined with tin. The inside of that would have been lined with tin. I've made them uh, and lined them with uh, uh, HVAC tape. You know, that goes on the, mm -hmm. goes on the outside of it. Stick that in, which is like it. Which is like it. You just stick down some HVAC tape in there, and it looks just like tin, a tin line. So you had your, your tea stored in. Well, there's some tea in that one too. Oh, great. And I, boy, boy, smells good. <laughs> uh, we talked about the uh, black white barber pole lining. There's some scrap I had left over. You make your own? Uh huh, I did. I will talk about that tomorrow. Good. I got, I got some uh, show set up. It's not hard to do it at all. Once you see how to do it. Anyway, this would have been a, a federal American made tea caddy, copied from an English design. And this would have been lined with, uh, this is called book binders paper. That's, a, uh, that's French book, book binders paper. The best is come, comes from Turkey. We didn't, didn't cost much. Mm -hmm. If you look at old, old books and open up in the front, you'll see mm -hmm. the book binders paper in the front. And they used it from the inside of them. Inside of tea caddy. Did you make that? Did you make the paper? Oh no! So I know people that do, but I didn't. There's a Loaded paper. on the water. Yeah, yeah, but it's really neat watching them do it. Some, if I ever do it again, I'll get some home handmade stuff from somebody. I bought this from a company in Kansas or somewhere that sold me a three foot three foot sheet of it, and I just cut it up and glued it in there. Found out that about gluing that stuff, you can't use those glues we're talking about. You need to use paste, flour and water paste. That works better than modern glues. Modern glues, see how they pull up on the corners? Paste, I, I made these before and put paste in there and it doesn't do that. Uh, interesting about the eagle, uh, I have this sitting on a hunt board in my front hall and uh, when kids see that, what do you think the first thing they say is, young kids, when they see that? They walk up and they look at that. What is an eagle doing on a football? Mm -hmm. It looks like a football with the stitches, stars like stitches. Mm -hmm. 
Why is there an eagle on that football? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can you can often date a piece by the number of stars in the. This is a common pattern. This, that's what this is called. This is called a pattern. And uh, the use of stars is pretty important. This one has 23, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Oh, 18. It's got 18. Uh, Louisiana was the 18th state. And so it was made sometime after 1812, 1814. I think Louisiana came in in 1814. So this thing had to have been made after 1814. A lot of really old stuff have 13 on it. Sort of the original column. That's Ivory, that little inlay right there. And uh, this top is multi, multi pattern. You see this a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven eight, eight pieces, and then a and then a oval in the middle. That's a, you see that all the time on the federal furniture, on drawer fronts. Tabletops, that was a common design. Uh, let's see. Uh, we were talking about chisels a little while ago. I always look, when I see chisels for sale, I always look at them. I found some of, the, some of these. This came from a guy who did a lot of inlaying in New England. And you, you saw me using my little uh, X Acto knife chisel. This is what he used. I bought it from him when he sold out. It, man, it works great. You, because you can rock it and get in there and pick up the chips just fine. So I always look for uh, unusual chisels that uh, would help me in what, I'm, in what I'm doing. Let's see. Talked about the double side tape. Talked about that. Oh. This is a uh, Stanley number 66 beading tool. Uh, Lee Nelson makes a new one. Gosh, this one, all the nickel plate is gone off this, but I still use it. And you can still get the uh, cutters, all the cutters, the Lee Nelson cutters will fit this. And it does exactly the same as uh, some of the tools we've looked at before. It will, it will make an in, you can incise a line with it just, just like any of these other tools. Make beads with it, do all kinds of things with it. Uh, works well. A lot of tools that you get after you've used them for a while, you find out these things really aren't aren't very good. But but that one works. I like it. Uh, if you get a if you get a dial indicator, try to get one that's got fractions of an inch on it rather than thousandths. It helps me. I can't ever remember whether 125 thousandths is an eighth or a sixteenth. I think it's a sixteenth. Eight's two fifty. No, a quarter to 50 and 18, 25. My father was a machinist. My grandfather was a machinist. They only talked in fractions. <laughs> Never talked anything in inches. Okay. I think we got to a good point. We can break for lunch if that sounds all right for you. Sounds good.